Welcome to the grand tapestry of the Ottoman Empire, a dynasty that spanned over 6 centuries and 36 sultans. A journey through time, power and legacy that shaped the course of history. From humble beginnings on the rugged frontiers of Anatolia to the majestic courts of Constantinople, each sultan carved their mark on the annals of history. This is the story of visionaries and warriors, scholars and statesmen, conquerors and reformers. Our journey begins with Osman I, the founder of the dynasty. A leader whose dreams of a powerful state became the bedrock of an empire that would stand the test of time. From Osman I to the formidable Mehmed II, who conquered Constantinople and transformed it into Istanbul, each sultan left an indelible legacy. Experience the strategic brilliance of Selim the Grim, the artistic and architectural renaissance under Suleiman the Magnificent, and the turbulent times of Abdul Hamid II. Discover the rich cultural tapestry woven by these rulers, their patronage of the arts, and the architectural wonders that still stand today as symbols of their glory. Journey through epic battles, fierce rivalries, and political machinations. Witness the resilience of an empire that faced countless challenges, both from within and beyond its borders. Even in the echoes of their reign, the legacy of the Ottoman Sultans continues to resonate. Their stories are not just tales of the past, but living histories that shape our present and future. Join us as we embark on this captivating journey through the lives of all 36 sultans of the Ottoman Empire. From the birth of a dynasty to its final days, this is the saga of power, passion and legacy. Welcome to the Chronicles of the Ottoman Sultans. Before we dive into the incredible saga of all 36 Ottoman Sultans, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single chapter of this historic journey. Hit the like button to show your passion for history and help us bring more epic tales to life. In the heart of Anatolia, amidst the tranquility of nature and the whispers of history, a story began that would change the course of empires. Born in 1258 C2 Atugru Bey, Osman grew up steeped in the traditions of his Turkic heritage. His early years were shaped by the nomadic life of the Kaye tribe, renowned for their resilience and bravery. As Osman matured, he demonstrated remarkable leadership qualities and a deep understanding of governance. His vision extended beyond the confines of his village, envisioning a united state that could defend against Byzantine and Mongol threats. Anatolia, fragmented by the waning Seljuk Sultanate and encroaching Mongol invasions, provided fertile ground for Osman's ambitions. His strategic alliances and military prowess soon earned him recognition among neighboring tribes. In 1299 C, Osman declared independence from the Seljuk Sultanate, marking the birth of the Ottoman Principality. His rule was marked by a commitment to justice, tolerance, and the prosperity of his people. Under Osman's leadership, the fledgling Ottoman state expanded steadily. His strategic acumen and alliances enabled the conquest of strategic fortresses and fertile lands, laying the foundation for future territorial expansions. Beyond military conquests, Osman fostered a cultural renaissance. He patronized scholars, poets, and artisans, promoting the flourishing of Islamic arts and sciences that would define the Ottoman cultural identity. Osman's reign was not without challenges. He navigated internal rivalries and external threats with wisdom and resolve, forging alliances that strengthened the Ottoman foothold in Anatolia. The strength of a ruler lies not in his sword alone, but in the hearts of his people Osman would often say, embodying the spirit of unity and resilience that defined his legacy. Sultan Osman I passed away in 1323 C, leaving behind a principality that would evolve into one of the greatest empires in history. His vision and leadership laid the cornerstone for the Ottoman Empire, a beacon of prosperity and diversity. After the death of Osman I, the fledgling Ottoman Empire stood at a crossroads. It was his son Orhan I who would inherit not only his father's vision, but also the mantle of leadership over a realm hungry for expansion and stability. Born in 1281, Orhan was raised in the crucible of early Ottoman struggles against Byzantine and neighboring emirates. His early years were marked by the lessons of his father's military campaigns and the wisdom imparted by the founding Sultan himself. Orhan I ascended to the throne in 1323, inheriting a realm that stretched from the fertile plains of Bithynia to the strategic stronghold of Bursa. His reign would be defined by both military conquests and administrative reforms. Under Orhan's leadership, the Ottoman Empire expanded its territories deeper into Anatolia and beyond. Cities such as Nicomedia and Ikea fell to Ottoman hands, solidifying their dominance in the region. 
Culturally, Oran I first patronized the arts and oversaw the construction of significant architectural marvels, including mosques and public works that laid the foundation for the grandeur of future Ottoman achievements. Yet challenges loomed large. Oran navigated intricate alliances and rivalries among neighboring states, balancing diplomacy with decisive military action to ensure the stability and growth of his empire. Orhan the first legacy extends beyond territorial expansion. His governance laid the groundwork for the Ottoman administrative system, blending tribal traditions with centralized authority, a model that would endure for centuries. As we reflect on the reign of Orhan I, we witness the birth of a dynasty that would shape the course of history. Sultan Orhan I passed away in 1362, leaving behind a legacy of expansion, cultural growth and governance. His reign laid the groundwork for the Ottoman Empire's rise to greatness. As the Ottomans bid farewell to their beloved Sultan Orhan I, the weight of succession falls upon his son, Murad. Stepping into the footsteps of greatness, Murad I would not only continue his father's legacy, but also shape the empire's destiny in ways unforeseen. Murad, born amidst the splendor of Bursa, inherited not only the throne but the mantle of leadership during a crucial era of Ottoman expansion. His reign, marked by a potent blend of military acumen and statesmanship, would pave the way for future sultans. Under Murad's strategic vision, the Ottoman Empire surged forth, consolidating its foothold in Anatolia and advancing deep into the Balkans. From the shores of the Aegean to the rugged mountains of Thrace, his armies carved a path of conquest and consolidation. Amidst the clamor of battle, Murad was also a patron of the arts and sciences, fostering a cultural renaissance that blossomed within the Ottoman courts. Artists, poets and scholars found refuge and support, enriching the empire's cultural tapestry. Yet, the path to glory was fraught with challenges. Murad faced fierce resistance from rival powers and internal dissent. His resolve was tested time and again, forging him into a leader of unwavering determination. Victory is not measured by conquest alone, but by the unity and prosperity we bring to our lands. Let our banners fly high, for our empire is built on strength and justice. As the sun sets on Murad as reign, his legacy endures. His military prowess expanded the Ottoman borders, his patronage enriched the cultural fabric, and his wisdom steered the empire through turbulent times. Murad I departed this world, leaving behind a realm stronger and more unified than ever before. His legacy, etched in the annals of Ottoman history, serves as a beacon of inspiration for generations to come. Tragically, Sultan Murad I met his end on the battlefield in 1389, during the Battle of Kosovo. His death marked a profound loss for the empire, yet his legacy continued to shape its destiny. The year is 1389. The battlefield of Kosovo stands silent, yet echoes with the cries of victory and loss. Sultan Murad I, the Lion of Rumelia, lies slain, his legacy a tapestry of conquest and unity. Amidst the grief and uncertainty, his son rises to lead the dawn of a new era under Sultan Bayezid I. Born around 1354 in Anatolia, Bayezid witnessed firsthand the transformative reign of his father. Raised amidst the clash of empires and the forging of a formidable state, he inherited not only a kingdom, but a vision. In the years following Kosovo, the Ottoman Empire would experience a strange fate. Under Sultan Murad's successor Bayezid I, they would enter the 15th century more powerful than they had ever been. But within a decade, the empire was on the verge of being dismantled. Sultan Murad's assassination at the Battle of Kosovo in 1389 meant that a new sultan had to take his place. His son Bayezid immediately took the reins of control, executing his brother Yuk on the battlefield. Deservedly nicknamed Yildirim, meaning Thunderbolt, Bayezid's reign was an active one filled with military campaigns and conquest. His father's death was interpreted as an opportunity by some of the Anatolian Baliks to move against the increasingly powerful and aggressive Ottomans. So Bayezid spent the first three years of his reign campaigning against his fellow Turkic Baliks. With the help of soldiers provided by his Christian vassals, he was able to take over all of Western Anatolia. This expansion benefited the Ottomans economically as they now had greater control of the land and sea trade routes that connected East and West. After making peace with the powerful Karamanid Beylik, Bayezid set his focus on Europe. At the same time, in 1394, Constantinople was put under siege by the Ottomans for the first time. Being caught in the middle of their territories, Constantinople would have been the logical choice for an Ottoman capital. In the Balkans, Bayezid quickly annexed Bulgaria and Macedonia, and he even threatened to move beyond the Danube River. 
This alarmed the Hungarians, who at the time were a great power in their own right. At the behest of various parties, a crusade was organized in 1396 to stem the advance of the Ottomans. The crusader forces, led by King Sigismund of Hungary, were decisively defeated at the Battle of Nicopolis. Victory meant that Ottoman control of the Balkans south of the Danube River was undisputed. Commemorating the victory, Bayezid commissioned the Great Mosque of Bursa, the first in a long list of magnificent mosques that would come to form an enduring aspect of the Ottoman's legacy. Once the Balkans were neutralized, Bayezid resumed his campaign against the Baliks of Eastern Anatolia. In around 1398, he turned his attention to the two most powerful ones, the Karamanids and Eretna of Qadi Bohanoddin. Bayezid soon annexed both to the Ottoman realm. It has to be noted that all this tremendous growth was thanks in part to the Devshirme, the system of youth levy imposed on its Christian subjects. As part of this, young boys would forcibly be taken away and recruited into the Ottoman administration and military. The famed Janissary Infantry Unit was formed out of this system. Whilst there is evidence to suggest that the Ottoman practice of youth levies had existed earlier, it was really in the reign of Bayezid that it was institutionalized. Sultan Bayezid's expansion into eastern Anatolia opened up the prospect of a conflict with the great Turco-Mongolian conqueror, Timur, who at the turn of the 15th century was on campaign in Syria against the Mamluks. Timur viewed himself as the successor to the Mongol Ilkhanate dynasty's claim over Anatolia. The imperial ambitions of both men made an eventual conflict somewhat inevitable. Tensions culminated at the epic Battle of Ankara in 1402, where Timur's forces prevailed over the Ottomans and even managed to capture Sultan Bayezid. The beleaguered Sultan would die in captivity a few months later. Most of the Beliks annexed by Bayezid now became independent again, and the impending Ottoman takeover of Constantinople was delayed by 50 years. But the true significance of the Battle of Ankara was that it immediately brought about one of the most destructive episodes in Ottoman history, the Ottoman Interregnum. A civil war that lasted 11 years, it saw four of Bayezid's sons contest the throne. Isa, Suleiman, Mehmed, and Musa all fought until only one was left. The war experienced various twists and turns. Isa was knocked out at the start of the conflict. Subsequently, the eldest brother, Suleiman, was in the ascendancy until 1410, but he passed on his authority to Musa, who defeated and executed him. Musa was then defeated by Mehmed in 1413 and the new Sultan began to piece the empire back together. In Anatolia, Mehmed was unable to exert an aggressive policy towards the Baliks, fearing disapproval from Timur's son and successor, Shahrukh. In Europe, the Christian Balkan states acted independently and had even regained some land back. But fortunately for the Ottomans, their Balkan rivals could not effectively take advantage of their weakness, meaning that their position in Rumelia remained fairly strong. So why were the Ottomans able to survive a politically traumatic experience like an 11-year-long civil war? The most convincing answer has been offered by the esteemed Turkish historian Halil Enalcik, who argued that it was because of the system of central government which provided the Ottoman state with a strong infrastructure that could thus withstand the shock of the civil war. The slaves turned administrators that were developed from the Divshem system offered the dynasty a level of continuity and stability even as the civil war raged on. Sultan Mehmed's death in 1421 brought about a succession that showed that the ghosts of the Ottoman civil war were still alive. Mehmed was succeeded by his young son Murad I, I who immediately had to contend with his uncle Mustafa for the throne. Mustafa had been held by the Byzantine Emperor Manuel II, who enjoyed a slight resurgence of his authority in the aftermath of the Battle of Ankara. Partly due to the Byzantine policy of keeping Ottoman claimants to the throne and then releasing them at opportune times so that the ensuing divisions could wreak havoc on their Turkish foes. Murat's uncle, although considered by the Ottomans to be an imposter, was able to take control of Rumelia and looked poised to knock his nephew off the throne. Mustafa had the support of various prominent Muslim frontier warrior leaders in the Balkans who had been essential in the expansion of the Ottoman realm into Christian territories. But at times they grew disillusioned by the Ottoman efforts to centralize its authority over territories that the frontier warriors had conquered with the Ottomans. In 1422, Murad, I, I was able to defeat his uncle and executed him. But his internecine wars were not over. In the same year, he decided to punish the Byzantines for their meddling in Ottoman affairs by putting Constantinople under siege. The Anatolian Baliks, fond of their newfound independence, saw this as an opportunity to deal a blow to the Ottomans. Murad's younger brother, who was also called Mustafa and had fled to the Karamanids upon his father's death, 
was encouraged by various Baliks to stake his claim for the throne. Equipped with an army, he besieged Bursa, thus forcing Murad to call off his siege of Constantinople and deal with his little brother. Shortly thereafter, Murad defeated and strangled his younger brother to death. In the mid-1420s, Murad put an end to all the Baliks of Western Anatolia by annexing them for the last time. Having thus consolidated his rule, Sultan Murad II now shifted his focus to the Balkans. After reconquering the city of Thessaloniki in 1430 from the Venetians, much of Murad's focus in the region revolved around a rivalry with Hungary. Serbia, a long-time vassal, was annexed into the Ottoman realm in 1439. In the background to this, renewed efforts had been made by various parties in Christendom for a crusade against the Ottomans. In 1439, the centuries-long schism between Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity was officially ended. This Christian optimism led to the Crusade of Varna in 1443. Originally starting well for the Crusaders, the multinational coalition soon slowed down when a visible disconnect began to emerge between the Balkan states and the Western Christian Crusaders. This resulted in the Balkan Christians agreeing to a truce with the Sultan in the summer of 1444. Sultan Murad immediately followed this up by crossing into Anatolia and making peace with the Karamanids. With both his eastern and western frontiers secured, Sultan Murad remarkably decided to abdicate in favor of his 12-year-old son, Mehmet II. Sensing an opportunity, the Hungarians immediately reneged on the truce. The Ottoman Grand Vizier, Kandali Halil Pasha recalled the retired Sultan, who duly responded by marching straight to the battlefield at Varna on the Romalian coast of the Black Sea. At the subsequent Battle of Varna, the Ottomans defeated the Christian coalition and Murad went back into his retirement. His second retirement was only a little longer than his first one. The young Sultan Mehmed's decision to debase the currency drew widespread negative reactions, especially from those employed by the state such as the Janissaries. So in 1446, once again at the request of the Grand Vizier, Sultan Murad came back to take his crown. Despite the victory at Varna, Ottoman authority in the Balkans was still unstable. In Albania, Jaja Castriotti, also known as Skanderbeg, was in the beginning stages of his 25-year-long resistance against the Ottomans. Further north, the danger from the Hungarians had not been extinguished. Under the leadership of the energetic regent, John Hunyadi, Hungary organized a Christian coalition which had a showdown with Sultan Murad's forces at the fiercely contested Second Battle of Kosovo in 1389. The result was an Ottoman victory, and just like the first one. The implications were significant. The Balkans were pacified for the time being and the fate of the iconic city, Constantinople, was sealed. Nobody was going to come to their rescue now. War weary from constant conflict, Murat finally got the peace he wanted when he passed away in 1451. In an age of rising empires and clashing civilizations, one name carved itself into the very bedrock of history. A name that would shape the destiny of nations and alter the course of the world. This is the story of Sultan Mehem II, forever known as Mehmed the Conqueror. Born into a world of power, ambition and treachery, Mehmed was more than just a ruler, he was a force of nature. From the moment he ascended the throne, he sought not only to inherit an empire but to expand it, to build a legacy that would defy time itself. At the tender age of 21, he achieved what many believed impossible. With unmatched brilliance and determination, he brought the thousand-year-old walls of Constantinople crashing down, fulfilling the dreams of his ancestors and turning the city into the jewel of his empire. But Mehmed's story doesn't end with the fall of Byzantium. His life was marked by legendary rivalries and battles that would echo through the ages. Among them was his intense and brutal rivalry with Vlad the Impala, known to the world as Dracula. Their confrontations were not merely about power, but a deadly chess game between two of the most fearsome minds of their time. As Mehmed expanded his empire, he also forged an identity that would haunt Europe and inspire our across the world. From his daring military campaigns to his patronage of the arts and sciences, Mehmed was a man of complexity, both a fearsome warrior and a visionary statesman. He united lands, cultures and peoples under one banner, leaving a legacy that would forever change the course of history. The echoes of his conquests still resonate today, and his impact can be felt far beyond the borders of the empire he built. Join us as we delve into the life of the man who reshaped the world with his ambition, his intellect and his iron will. Discover the legend of Mehmed the Conqueror, a ruler who not only seized the city but changed the fate of continents. If you're captivated by stories of power, intrigue and the people who shaped our world, subscribe to ancient perspectives and embark on a journey through the ages. The past has never been closer.
Born on March 30th, 1432, to Sultan Murad II and his concubine Yuma Khatun, Mehmed was named in honor of his grandfather, Mehmed I. The future Sultan spent his formative years in the Ottoman capital of Edirne before being sent to Amasya, where he was groomed from a tender age in the art of governance and immersed in a comprehensive education. Under the guidance of his tutors, young Mehmed was schooled in religion, history, an array of foreign languages, and the extensive knowledge befitting the son of a sultan. His childhood, though typical for an Ottoman prince, was set on an extraordinary trajectory when he reached the age of 12. Sultan Murad II, Mehmed's father, was a ruler burdened by internal strife and external conflicts. His reign was fraught with challenges, both within the empire and from foreign adversaries, leading the 44-year-old Sultan to seek solace in retirement at Bursa, relinquishing the throne to his 12-year-old son in 1444. Thus began Mehmed II's initial experience as the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. Neither Mehmed nor those around him found comfort in the notion of a child ascending the throne amidst such turmoil. At 12, Mehmed was ill-prepared and unwilling to bear the weight of the empire's troubles. As threats from abroad loomed large and the Ottoman nobility faced a crisis, Sultan Mehmed, alongside his Grand Vizier Halil Kandala, penned urgent letters to the former Sultan, beseeching him to return to the throne he had forsaken. Mehmed's words to his father were sharp and resolute if you are the Sultan, come and lead your armies. If I am the Sultan, the first hereby order you to come and lead my armies. Confronted with a command he could neither defy nor disregard, Murad returned to reclaim his throne, and Mehmed willingly stepped aside, allowing his father to resume control just in time for the Battle of Varna against the European Crusaders. Freed from the burdens of rulership, Mehmed refocused on his studies, gathering the knowledge and experience that would be indispensable when Murad II relinquished the throne for the second and final time following his death in 1451. With his ascension as an adult, Mehmed II was determined and ambitious, ready to implement a series of bold changes and initiatives. Inspired by the legendary exploits of Alexander the Great, the Sultan wasted no time in embarking on his grand plans. One of the defining strategies of Mehmed's reign was his remarkable policy of tolerance. Unlike many monarchs of his era, Mehmed displayed an extraordinary degree of religious tolerance towards his diverse imperial subjects. While he was intolerant of dissent and opposition to his authority, he embraced differing religious beliefs, which garnered him widespread support and cooperation across his empire. Moreover, Mehmed was known for his progressive policies that favored the less fortunate, often extending his benevolence to the lowest runs of society. One of his most ingenious moves was redistributing lands from the nobility to the slave class, a tactic that not only secured loyalty from the lower classes, but also kept the powerful nobility in check. Mehmed's brilliance as a leader extended far beyond simply winning the loyalty of his people. He possessed a keen understanding of the importance of solidifying his authority and he was determined to ensure that his power remained unchallenged. Unlike some of his six predecessors, Mehmed was not content to rely on the existing aristocracy. Instead, he sought to surround himself with men whose loyalty was unwavering, devoted solely to him and his cause. To achieve this, he established a more centralized and highly organized administration, designed to function as a unified and faithful entity. This allowed Mehmed the freedom to direct his attention beyond the borders of the Ottoman Empire, pursuing his broader ambitions. Great leaders like Mehmed, however, often have interests that reach beyond the realm of governance and warfare. For the seventh Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, the arts and literature were his true passions. Mehmed had a deep appreciation for classical literature and was captivated by the works of Renaissance artists. During his reign, he created a vast library that housed over 8,000 volumes in languages ranging from Arabic and Greek to Latin and Persian. His love for the arts was further demonstrated when he commissioned several Renaissance artists from the West. The most famous depiction of him, the portrait we recognize today, was painted by none other than Gentile Bellini. Mehmed's enthusiasm for foreign arts was not just a matter of personal taste, it was also fueled by his impressive linguistic abilities. He was fluent in multiple languages, including Latin, Greek, Persian, Serbian, Arabic, and Turkish. This linguistic prowess allowed him to engage with the cultural and intellectual achievements of diverse civilizations, enriching his own understanding and inspiring his reign. Yet, Mehmed II's education was not confined to the arts and languages. His intellectual curiosity knew no bounds. He was deeply interested in a wide array of subjects, including mathematics, astronomy, arithmetic, geography, philosophy, and religious theology. 
This breadth of knowledge made him a wise and cultured ruler, but Mehmed was more than just a scholar. Indeed, his legacy would be cemented by his military prowess, earning him the rightful title of the conqueror, the most renowned and significant of Mehmed's campaigns, was the one that would forever change the course of history, the conquest of Constantinople. From the moment he ascended the throne, Mehmed was determined that it would be he who would finally bring the Byzantine capital under the control of the Muslim Empire, ending the era of Byzantium as the world had known it. Mehmed II was a man of resolve, where neither exceptions nor excuses had any place in his grand vision, and failure was a notion he would not entertain. With the Bosporus Straits already under his control and the construction of the formidable Rumelisari fortress standing opposite Anadolisari, the Sultan was in no mood for delays. Constantinople, weakened by relentless plagues and repeated incursions, was ripe for the taking. The time had come. After swift and decisive preparations, Mehmed delivered an ominous ultimatum to the Byzantine Emperor surrender now, or your empire will be reduced to dust and ashes. It was a terrifying proclamation from a formidable imperial power, but despite the Sultan's imposing words, he was still a young ruler with much to prove, and the Byzantines were far from a feeble adversary. As Mehmed anticipated, Emperor Constantine XI Paleologos dismissed the Ottoman demand. If Mehmed wanted Constantinople, he would have to fight for it. On April 2nd, 1453, the Ottoman Empire commenced its siege on the fading, yet still resilient capital of the once great Byzantine Empire, the successor to Rome. Mehmed was resolute in ensuring this would be a victorious siege. He brought with him a vast army, estimated between 100,000 and 200,000 strong, supported by a naval force of over 300 vessels and a formidable array of up to 60 cannons. To prepare for this monumental assault, the Sultan had enlisted the talents of engineers and gunsmiths from across the region to craft his massive artillery, and now he was ready to unleash their might. The siege that followed was unlike anything the Byzantines had ever faced. For nearly two months, the full scope of Sultan Mehmed's ingenuity and strategic brilliance was on display. The colossal cannons thundered relentlessly, and in a stroke of genius, Mehmed ordered his naval ships to be transported overland along a path of greased logs, circumventing a critical Byzantine barrier. It was through these extraordinary efforts that Mehmed, I, I was earning his title as the conqueror in a spectacular fashion. Finally, on May 29, 1453, the unthinkable happened, the illustrious capital of the Byzantine Empire fell, and with it, the last Byzantine emperor met his demise. Sultan Mehmed II had achieved what many before him could not Constantinople was now his. Styling himself as the Caesar of the Roman Empire, Mehmed the Conqueror immediately turned his gaze to his next target Serbia. Though the full subjugation of the Serbian despotate would not be realized until the end of the 1450s, the Ottoman campaign in the region began the very year after Constantinople's conquest. Serbia had long been a vassal of the Ottoman Empire, so it was no surprise that Mehmed sought to consolidate his power there. However, it would ultimately be his great-grandson who would extend Ottoman control as far as Belgrade. Mehmed himself faced formidable resistance from John Hunyadi of Hungary, a challenge that forced the Sultan to shift his focus to other matters. While the fall of Constantinople had left only fragments of Byzantine territory intact, some remnants still persisted. Among these was the Despotate of Morat, a region the Ottomans had been entangled with for some time. Although the Despotate existed as an Ottoman vassal, its despots, Demetrius and his brother proved to be inept rulers. The region was spiraling into unrest, and when the brothers of the late Byzantine Emperor failed to pay their annual tribute to the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed the Conqueror found the perfect pretext to launch a new campaign. By the summer of 1460, the despotate of Mora had succumbed to the Ottoman Empire, a direct result of its rulers' incompetence and the Sultan's relentless ambition. Yet, Mehmed the Conqueror was far from finished. Mora was not the only lingering remnant of the once great Byzantine Empire. The nearby empire of Tribizal also had to be brought to its knees if Mehmed was to fully claim all that remained of Byzantium. With the fall of its allies and the Ottoman threat looming, the emperor of Trebizond, David, understood the grim reality that any outside help would be difficult to come by. In a desperate bid to secure assistance, he sought to forge alliances with his eastern neighbors, hoping that these unconventional friendships might offer some form of protection. However, in a move that perhaps undermined his efforts, David attempted in 1460 to free Trebizond from its obligation to pay tribute to the Ottoman Sultan. He made this audacious request directly to Mehmed, hoping for leniency. But Mehmed was not one to entertain such pleas. 
His response came the following year in the form of a full-scale invasion of Trebizond. The Eastern allies upon whom David had pinned his hopes proved to be of little help, and one, the ruler of Sinop, surrendered to the Ottomans as they marched toward Trebizond. As the Ottoman land forces and navy closed in, it became clear that the days of the emperor and his territory were numbered. Realizing that no aid was forthcoming and that his only chance at survival was to capitulate, David ultimately chose to negotiate a surrender. Talks soon led to the official capitulation of both Emperor David and Trebizond, thus extinguishing the last vestiges of Byzantium as the successor to the once glorious Roman Empire. The complete and awe-inspiring conquest of all that the Greeks had left to call their own stands as one of Mehmed's most celebrated achievements. However, this was just one of many triumphs for the Sultan. Another of Mehmed's most renowned campaigns was his ongoing conflict with the Principality of Wallachia and his intense rivalry with a man he had once known well Vlad III Dracula. For nearly a century after its founding, the Ottomans had persistently sought to bring Wallachia under their influence, if not direct control. At the same time, the Ottoman Empire's fierce adversaries in Hungary were also striving to subjugate Wallachia by placing their own puppets on the throne. This tug of war turned Wallachia into two things a buffer zone between powerful enemies and a land plagued by constant turmoil and shifting leadership. Even during Mehmed's childhood, Wallachia had been a source of trouble for Sultan Murad II on several occasions. Distrust of its ruler Voivod Vlad II Dracul led Murad to summon the leader and detain his two youngest sons as political hostages. These sons, Radu III and Vlad III Dracula, would henceforth grow up alongside Mehmed. Following the deaths of Vlad II and his eldest son Misia II, the Ottomans recognized the need to act swiftly to install a new voivode in Wallachia, who would be loyal to their interests before the Hungarians could do the same. Despite Vlad III being somewhat troublesome during his time in Ottoman custody, unlike his brother Radu Mora chose Vlad, the elder of the two, to succeed their father. Vlad III's first stint as voivode of Wallachia was short-lived. His Hungarian-backed cousin, Vladislav II, overthrew him after only a month. As the mid-15th century progressed, Wallachia remained a battleground, up for grabs once more as the Ottomans and Hungarians continued to be for control. In 1456, Vlad III once again ascended to the Wallachian throne, this time with the backing of Hungary. Despite Mehmed now leading the Ottoman Empire, the idea that Vlad might at least tolerate the Ottomans as a vassal didn't seem far-fetched, considering that the two had been allies and even childhood companions. Had rather been in Vlad's position, this might have been the case. But Vlad, I, I, I held a very different view from his brother, he harbored a deep-seated hatred for the Ottomans. Any forgiveness he might have had was already spent on his former enemy, John Hunyadi, for the role he played in Vlad's father's death. Mehmed, however, would receive no such mercy. By the late 1450s, Wallachia had ceased paying tribute to the Sultan, and by 1462, Vlad had initiated open war against the Ottomans. Mehmed's victory over Vlad, I, 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 I may have come later than he anticipated or desired, but eventually did them. After a grueling conflict that nearly forced the Sultan into retreat, Radu was finally placed on the Wallachian throne in his elder brother's stead as the summer drew to a close. Mehmed was confident that this son of Dracul would remain loyal. Except for a brief period in 1476, when Vlad I, I, I reclaimed the principality and a turbulent series of depositions and reinstatements between Radu and another relative, Basarablayota, the Ottomans had effectively secured control over Wallachia, allowing them to turn their attention to other conquests. Soon after his success in Wallachia, Mehmed the Conqueror once again lived up to his title by annexing the Kingdom of Bosnia. His invasion led to a swift victory and the execution of Bosnia's king, demonstrating that Mehmed's ambitions extended westward as well as into the Eastern Balkans. His expansionary campaign soon brought him into conflict with the Venetians, leading to an all-out war. The Venetians, allied with Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, the son of Met's old adversary, John Hunyadi invaded Ottoman-held Morea and Bosnia. Three years into this prolonged conflict, Mehmed came face to face with the legendary Skanderbeg of Albania, yet another former political hostage of the Ottoman Empire. Although disease eventually aided the Ottomans in their struggle against the Albanians, the war itself would rage on for a total of 15 years. It was only in 1479, with the signing of the Treaty of Constantinople, that Mehmed secured victory. The treaty weakened the Venetians and required them to pay a yearly tribute to the Ottomans for trading rights in the Black Sea. Once again, the Sultan had proven his worth as a conqueror. But Mehmed's ambitions didn't end there. 
By this time, the Ottomans had established a firm hold over Anatolia and had made Moldavia a vassal state, albeit for a short period. Peter III Aaron of Moldavia had been one of the first rulers of the principality to agree to pay yearly tribute to the Ottoman Empire, but his successor Stephen I. I. Stefan Selmar was staunchly opposed to such an arrangement for much of his life. This predictably led to military conflict between the Ottomans and the new voivode of Moldavia a war in which Mehmet faced setbacks similar to those he had encountered in Wallachia. However, unlike in Wallachia, Mehmet found no clear path to victory and eventually withdrew from the region. Stephen remained a persistent thorn in the Sultan's side for years to come. As frustrating as the Moldavian campaign may have been, it was but a minor issue in the grand scheme of things. The Ottoman Empire had grown immensely thanks to the efforts of the bold Sultan, expanding both eastward and westward. Failure is not a word commonly associated with Mehmet the Conqueror, and despite the setback in Moldavia, his ambitions remained undeterred. He now turned his gaze toward Italy. It is widely believed that Mehmet's ambitions in Italy extended as far as Rome a fear shared by both the Pope and the people of Rome. When Otranto fell to an Ottoman invading force, the citizens of Rome braced themselves for the worst, preparing to flee as the spectre of Ottoman conquest loomed large. But the conquest of Italy would never come to pass. On May 3, 1481, Sultan Mehmed II, the great conqueror of Anatolia and the Balkans, passed away. His dreams of expanding his empire into Italy ended abruptly with his death. The circumstances surrounding his death remain shrouded in mystery. It is believed that the Sultan fell ill a few days before his passing, but some historians suggest a more sinister cause poisoning remains a highly suspected theory. Regardless of how he died, the glorious Sultan was gone, leaving behind a legacy of power, wisdom and cultural achievement. Still known today as the Conqueror. Memai I lived a life of monumental accomplishments, ensuring that his name would be remembered both at home and across the world for generations to come.